Welcome everyone to our inaugural Geography Matters event. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. This event is entirely online um, and is the first in our new series of Geography Matters events where we'll be sharing a little bit more insight into why geography matters even in our modern day society with speakers from all across Queensland talking about their research, their work and their love of geography. Tonight we're going to be joined by Karen Joyce who is going to be presenting A Geographic Journey for All Ages and Stages, interviewed by our very own RGSQ President, John Tasker. As we begin this afternoon, or this evening rather, um, I'd like to acknowledge the First Nations peoples from our land, um, and indeed some people who I consider to be the first geographers of our land. In particular tonight, I'm joining you from my home in Kuparu in Mianjin, Brisbane, and I'd like to acknowledge the Turrbal and the Yagra people as the traditional owners of this country that I'm on. Um, if you would like to take a moment to acknowledge your own traditional owners um, in your own place, wherever you're joining us from tonight, that would also be lovely. As we progress with this evening, um, I'm now gonna hand over to Karen uh, to give us perhaps a little bit of a insight into her presentation this evening, a geography journey for all ages and stages. Thanks so much, Giselle, and hi, everyone. Thanks for joining this evening. I'm joining from Trinity Beach in far north Queensland, which is on Irrigangi land, so some people might know it as just north of Cairns. So if you do know the land on which you're joining from this evening, I'd love to see it in the chat. I really enjoy starting to learn the different names of the different country around Australia as well. So if you want to pop that in, I'd love to see that. Now, I'm also going to pop in the chat um, uh, two links there. The first is a link that has all my social media um, and personal links there as well. There's, there's a range of them that I'll talk about this evening as well. Um, but just so you've got that all in one place. And the second is the presentation itself. So the presentation will be running behind me. And if you do want to have that on in your own screen and follow along or look at it later as well, feel free to do that. So I'm going to give a bit of a talk about a little bit about my history, how I got into geography and some of the work that I'm doing at the moment. So first of all, I wanted to introduce you to really what drives me as a geospatial scientist. So a lot of the work that I do is on the Great Barrier Reef, so this part of Queensland that I imagine many of you are really comfortable with looking at. And I'm going to zoom all the way in here to Heron Reef, so on the southern end of the Great Barrier Reef. And the question that's been driving me since the late 90s is just one question, and that's how much live coral do we have on the Great Barrier Reef? And so as I zoom in, it'll get a little bit clearer and I want you to have a think about this. It might be a little bit difficult to see on the screen, but given the satellite data that we have available, I was wondering if you could pop in the chat and let me know if you think that you're able to see live coral in this image here. I'm going to zoom in as much as I can. And if I asked you to map live coral with a yes or no, do you think you'd be able to do that using this image here? So let me know, yes, if you reckon you can see live coral or in for no, if, no, no chance. Any other thoughts there at all? Not ready to <laughs> tap into the keyboard there? That's okay. So I imagine for most of you, it's pretty hard. In fact, for me and actually anyone, this is not a possible task. And this, this again, is something that's really, really challenging for me. I've been using satellite and airborne data for about 25 years now, and still this, this is the problem. How much live coral do we have? And so what this has done for me is to drive me to, towards other types of Earth observation data. And in particular, I'm interested in drones. And so this is from the exact same area that I just showed you with the highest resolution possible sat satellite data. And I want you to have a good look at this. And, and if you can't see it quite so well on the screen behind me, definitely jump in on that link and just see that you can actually see all the beautiful coral here. So it's all around the edges. And you can even, if you zoom in, you can even see sea cucumbers and sea stars in this image. So this is taken from a drone at 20 metres altitude. And this is what I find really, really exciting about Earth observation is how we can use drones to give us all this information that we would never 
be able to get from satellites or other forms of aerial data as well. So I just want to go quickly through some of the drone benefits that I see. So I did mention the benefit of the, the spatial detail of satellite versus drone. So if we have a look at this image here, left-hand side satellite and the right-hand side drone data, one directly on top of the other. And so you should be able to see here, we've got some buildings on an island. This is in Belize, this is carried okay. And as we move across, we've got a whole lot of seagrass here that you'd never be able to tell from the satellite data. And we've got different patches of coral here and really, really great depth of detail with that drone data. One of the other things I really enjoy about drone data is that you can fly anywhere, anytime you like. I work with a lot of First Nations traditional owner ranger groups, and it's really great to be able to see them get out there and fly their country and capture data as they need it and when they want it as well. And as we know with satellite data, it is a pain if there's clouds. So if you're interested in mapping flooded areas, drones, again, fantastic fly underneath the clouds and we're going to get that information that we need. Again, anywhere, anytime, and we're actually out on the reef here off the back of a boat, being able to work at the right time between the tides, the cloud, little squalls that come through and, and making sure that we capture the right, da right data exactly when it is that we need to do so. I also really like with drone data that we're able to use it to create three-dimensional models as well. So on the left side, basic drone data, and on the right side, I'm going to swipe over now, we can look at digital terrain and digital surface models as well. So being able to capture that type of information to look at structure, maybe a structure on the reef, the different bombies that we have, or if we're looking at tree heights, anything like that we can get from this overlapping drone data, which is super cool and not something that we're getting quite so easily from the satellite data. So one of the things that I like to do this is also to start thinking about if this is, this is something that we want to work into in the future. So how do we actually start to develop our future workforce to be able to, to understand this type of technology and to work with that as well? And so one of the programs that, that I started six or seven years ago now is called SheMaps. And really, this is all about thinking, how do we get kids as early as possible getting engaged in geospatial science? And so what you'll see on the video as it plays, plays beside me here is we've got kids working with some basic coding. They're using drones that are about the size of the palm of their hand, and they're using it to stop, solve geospatial problems. In this case, they're given a scenario to go and, and map an area, and that area is a, an area on the ground, and then really achieving success in being able to do that as well. And this is really based on the concept of a day in the life of a geospatial scientist that we package up into a short program that we run in schools. And as we do this, we also work not just with schools, but or not just with the students, but with the teachers as well, because we know that if we can influence one teacher, then we can actually influence many students, not just for today, but in years to come as well. And we know that 40% of teachers teaching geography are trained in geography. And so that's a huge gap with the ability for teachers to teach content if they're not actually trained in those areas as well. So really working with those teachers to try and build their capacity so that we're getting greater skills as we're getting students coming through into university, into the workforce as well. And one of the things that we get the teachers to do with the kids, this is one of my favorite things that we do each year, we have a, a competition where we get the students to work out how cool their school is. So you can see a group of students here, this is from, from the school poster on social media. They're looking at satellite data of their school campus, working out how much percentage of tree shade they have on their school campus. And there's a link there in the, in the, in the presentation if you want to have a look at that competition or share with your local school as well. So here's some of the past entries in that competition. So again, they're trying to work out how much tree shade they have. So we've got the youngest kids uh, doing hand-drawn maps after looking at satellite data. Then we've got students who are manually digitizing all the way through the students using Google Earth Engine as part of this program as well. 
And then what we find is that we have schools then that realise just how low the percentage of tree shade is on their campus. This particular school here then actually petitioned, the students petitioned their parents and teachers association to actually go out and, and build some more shade sales as well in areas where the, it wasn't possible to get tree shade in there. So it was really cool to see them actually taking it that step further and realizing that they're custodians as well. And this is this is the way they can become change makers in their own right ge using geospatial information. But for our youngest students, we have a, a, a fun kids book that we, we share around, we do readings, we sell the book and it comes with a little plushie as well. And we also give, for, for every sale of, of the Pippa and Droney book, we give one to, um, to a disadvantaged school as well. So if you're interested in sharing a book on, on how people are using drones around Australia is inspired by true stories, there's a link there in the presentation as well to go out and go and check out Pippa and Droney. It's a really fun book. One of the other things that we know is how important it is for people to be able to see things to know if that's something that they may want to be in the future. And I was talking with John Tasker earlier today about how important this is and, and how often we see professions like the legal profession and the medical profession portrayed in all sorts of movies and TV shows, but how often do you see a geospatial professional and how do people even know that that's a job? We do have a poster series that we distribute across schools and it's free to download as well. It's in the presentation if you'd like to grab that and, and pass it around your local school or have in your workplace as well. That actually shows a range of different jobs that use geospatial and drone technology. And so what we're trying to do with this is to really build up uh, an entire workflow of a workforce from the youngest kids all the way through into advanced workforce and then build the networks that we can use to then collaborate with each other as well. And so this is another one of the projects that I'm working on at the moment. I've been working on for a couple of years and it's really all about working out how we can get everybody that captures drone data around the world to contribute to a global database. And so what you can see in the presentation behind me is a range of red dots all over the world. So more than 600,000 drone mapping images in the repository of GeoNADIA. You can see the listing of all the different ones there. And so we get people that add their data into this repository and then make it freely available for everybody to use as well. And as an example, let's just jump around and have a look at a couple of the other data sets that should actually be loading in the map just behind me, but it's not loading at the moment. So let's just have a look quickly. We've got some stuff from the Northern Territory looking at beautiful billabongs in Kakadu National Park. We've got areas looking at agriculture, uh, all, all the way across Asia and Europe. We've got areas up in the far north looking at glacier and permafrost snow. We also have um, various, um, various urban areas across Australia and in the United States as well. And urban areas in Uganda that's been used to help the police force over there. And also looking at pre and post fire burns in the ecosystem as well. So lots and lots of different types of data sets that are hosted on the hosted on the website. And I really encourage you to jump in and have a look at that at your own leisure. And if you've got your own data, drone data, why not jump in and, and add it to the system as well? Because really what we're trying to work on here is what we like to call a circular drone data economy. And the way that works is that we start with people capturing data. So capturing, go out, capture your drone data, using that to contribute to a global database like what we've built. And then we curate it. So we make it really easy and have the tools so that people can contribute and find things easily in one place. From there, you can create your own insights and collaborate with others to build on those insights and provide information back to the community, particularly around the ecosystems that you're most passionate about. 
And so we call this FAIR or findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And that's really the basis around what I've tried to do with all of my work that I'm capturing data but making it as available as possible so people can continue to build on that. So I really believe that all data should have a life beyond that for which it was originally captured. So why not make it available and see what more we can do with it. And I think I just want to finish with a quote here from Sir David Attenborough. He says, if working apart were a force powerful enough to destabilise our planet, surely working together we're powerful enough to save it. So with that, I'd like you to have a think about how it is that maybe we can collaborate together or you have other in the network who you like to collaborate with, with geospatial information, geospatial data, and how that helps us all move forward into the workforce and to create greater insights to understand our ecosystems. Thanks, Giselle. Thank you very much, Karen. I'm going to hand over to John now, um, and we might get into the interview section of this presentation. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Giselle. And Thank you, Karen. Really fascinating presentation and I think plenty of content for us to have a bit more of a conversation about. Really, to get started, apart from the exposure and trying to solve some of, the, of these problems, what would you say your first experience with geospatial technology was? My very first is, yeah. I, can, I can actually remember this really clearly. So I, I used to work with, um, I used to work at Kodak Express developing and processing photos, you know, back in the day when we used to do that. And I was I was working there over a university holiday. Uh, so it was in, in the late 90s. And one of the one of our regular customers came in. He was a wedding photographer. And I was was giving him his photos and you know doing the usual, do you want to buy an extra film and the upsell, that kind of thing. And we just we started chatting and he he asked me what I did outside working at Kodak and I mentioned I was a I was a student and he said what was what was I studying and I was studying a bachelor of science at the time and I, I had done first year geography though I wouldn't say that I'd been exposed to geospatial so much at the time and it turned out anyway that this this guy while he did wedding photography on his weekends he worked at Geoscience Australia. Oh, wow. And he said to me, he goes, oh, cool, so you'll be doing remote sensing soon. I said, oh, yeah, actually, I think that's in my study plan for next year. It was the Christmas holidays at the time. And he goes, well, why don't you come out and we can show you what we do at GA. I was like, yeah, cool, that sounds like fun. <laughs> um, and so I, did, I went out to Geoscience Australia and I clearly remember seeing the stream of the Landsat data coming down one of the big TVs. Oh, and cool. as soon as I saw that, I was like, this is this is the coolest thing ever. I'm so excited about learning remote sensing next year. And then, yeah, I was just sucked in from there, I think. As always, global data sets pulling us deeper in, into the technology. Yeah. Really fascinating, really fascinating. You, you spoke a bit uh, at the start about the opportunities of drones and how they're a really unique tool to be using. Apart from all those, are there any key limitations or challenges that we have when it comes to drone data and situations where it isn't the most appropriate solution? Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of the times it's a lot of time it's not the most appropriate solution. And one of the things I find really interesting there is I, I have people that come to me, they want to know which drone they should buy. And they can be not very happy if I tell them that they shouldn't buy a drone and actually the solution is satellite data or fuel based or something like that. And I think that drones are, drones are wonderful for a very specific use case. And that is absolutely not everything. And I think it's really important for anyone who's sort of wanting to get into that space that it's okay not to use drones as well, you know, you use the tool that's that suits. Um, I I actually I actually get quite upset when when people then insist that they will buy the drone and you just see a lot of money wasted in that space. So yeah. <laughs> There's I, I still love satellite data as well. And I think they've both got a time and a place and it's not one is any better than the other. Any learnings from having to operate drones in really austere environments at times on coral caves and remote parts of Australia? 
Yeah, I think when when I first started, I, I was really, really nervous about operating over the water. And I think when I speak to other people, they think they're the same. It's like, oh, over water, what if it crashes? Well, what if it crashes on land as well? Actually, your drone is cactus pretty much either way. But the the thing that I realised over the water is that it's actually far easier than over land because I have no obstacles and I have nothing in my way of my vision. So, you know, I usually have 360 awareness of the weather that's coming in, if there's birds or anything, there's no trees in my way. So I actually really, really enjoy being out on the water and feeling actually a lot safer because if the drone crashes, there's no way it's it's going to actually do any damage to anyone because there's no one around. Fair enough. I know I've my, my, when I've been flying, I've had my fair scuffle with uh, wedge-tailed eagles and the like, so it actually sounds a little bit uh, easier to operate in. <laughs> yeah, I've been lucky I haven't had any any incidents with any of those. <laughs> Some of there's smaller birds out on the reef, but I've not had any big ones. Probably for the best. <laughs> Fingers crossed. When it comes to she maps, then, and how we actually engage people about geospatial science, how have you gone about actually funding and trying to make this an, a rolling program? It's changed a lot over the years in terms of funding for she maps. So when I started it back in 2016, 2017, I was really fortunate to get both Queensland and federal government funding. And that was really amazing to sort of kickstart things. And then over the next next few years, we were largely based on the uh, user pays type model. So the schools will come to us and they'll pay a certain amount for an incursion, either for their students or for the teachers. And we still do that. And for the, the past few years, we've also had a wonderful partnership with the Surveyors Trust here in Queensland, and they've supported us a lot to deliver a lot of different programs throughout Queensland as well. Over the past, I guess the past 18 months or two years or so, we've been working more with the Surveyors Trust to think about how we how we merge this as a, as a model that's really a lot more industry driven as well. So we have a program that we call our, um, our partnering for purpose model. And that's really all about working with industry to help industry realize that not only do we, we actually have a, a diversity issue within the workforce, having around 20% women in the workforce, but we have we have a massive skills shortage as well. So at the moment we're sort of up around the four to five hundred number this year in 2023 in terms of where our skills shortage lies. And I know if there's anyone on the call that's trying to recruit into jobs at the moment, there's there's a lot of jobs out there and we don't necessarily have the people coming through with the right skills. So for us, when, when we look at the way GMAPS is going, yes, we still have some government funding, which is wonderful. Yes, we have schools that pay for incursions and we, we have a model where we use a lot of the government funding to support uh, schools in underprivileged areas so that we can sort of make it a lot more equitable as to who gets the training. But we are moving more towards looking at getting more industry partnerships to continue that as a, as a more sustainable model as well. So there's a there is a, a range of different ways that we that we fund it, and definitely open to partnerships if anyone's interested as well. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. In the engagement you've been having then with industry, and you're saying there's capable, you know skills gaps here, and I'm sure there might be someone on the call or some watching the recording who'll be thinking about how they plan out for their journey. What are those gaps and what types of skills do we need right now in the industry and into the future? Yeah, good question. I think I think there's a range of skills, both the soft skills, which are not exactly soft, but the, you know, like all that, and also the technical skills as well. And you know, certainly keen to hear from anyone that's on the call as well if they want to add extra comments into the chat on what you think your skill shortages are that you need in your workplace too but some of the things that I see is the ability to to critically review and understand a problem and, and work towards a solution so 
that might be through thinking outside the box, but it's really, really understanding what the problem is and pulling together the right people to collaborate and the right skills on those jobs as well, rather than just thinking, I must click this, then this, then this. So having a, a little bit more, I guess, the under, understanding of, of processes and that that full problem solving thought process rather than just a click and do. The other thing that I think we we have a shortage of is in in people who have a broader skills base that have the understanding of remote sensing and GIS spatial in general, as well as the strong coding background that allows us to process big data. And so we see people coming through with IT degrees and then we have the geospatial degrees, but I don't think that we talk enough to get geospatial IT people. And I think that that's, that's a critical shortage that I would like to see addressed in the future through some cross-pollination between those types of degrees. I see that, the, I do think that we've gone a bit of a full circle in, in terms of, you know, in the 80s and 90s, everything was coding, then we had a lot of graphical user interface work, but now we've come back to, hey, you know what, to really automate stuff, we really have to get back down to the base coding as well. So that does need to be in the mix there. Yep, I can definitely attest to, I wish I had more geospatial people who could code. <laughs> it's this, yeah. once you get over a certain volume of data, it just becomes a necessity to solve those big problems. Yeah. I, and it's, it's interesting because you can't just rely on people with IT skills to understand no. the issue properly as well. So, yeah, so having some full stack remote sensing people, having more of them be really, really valuable. Yeah, there's a lot to learn from projections to file formats to reflectance and accuracy and everything else in between. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking then of big data, Geo Nadir, it's a massive collection and obviously been growing quite quickly. What's been the biggest surprise for you in building it out as a solution? Biggest surprise? Throwing you a curly one there. It, yeah, I don't know. There's been surprises all the way. So for me, coming from the, the background of someone who I, I enjoy workflows, I enjoy developing a procedure to take something from capturing th data through to a product at the end. And so that uh, understanding how to do something, I really enjoy. And But then I also, under I also really enjoy analysing the data itself. The with Junadia, it has been probably my steepest learning curve over the past two years in terms of how you do that at scale and how how to get the right people as part of the team and working a lot more with IT people mm. as opposed to just the geospatial and wanting that full stack, the full stack people. Um, and um, being, I, I guess I, I get continually surprised at how much I need to learn about what I need to unlearn as well. I think we, in within GIS and remote sensing, I think there's certain things that we do that we accept that there's a way to do something, but that's not necessarily the best way. We just do it like that because we've always done it like that. And if we start to learn from other disciplines like graphic design and some parts of IT and go, hang on, they're doing similar, but they don't they don't make it that hard. How do we make it easier? So learning all that is surprising and fun and challenging. And yeah, yeah, really enjoy all of that stuff. No, it sounds like a unique and interesting challenge. From all of that then, obviously this is a big collection of citizen science data in some aspects and others from wherever throwing their data sets in. Do you have concerns about data privacy or how usable some of that data might be? Yeah, so I'll go with the data privacy before the usability first. So when when people upload the data to the to the platform, they can choose if they want it to be private or if they want it to be fair or findable, accessible, interoperable, and usable. 
I would say 99.9% of those who upload to the platform um, make it available for to you. So uh, absolutely no privacy concerns in that, in that space in terms of it being their data and being able to be used outside of that. If there are privacy concerns in terms of where they've captured that data and who might be in the imagery or whatever, that's that's sort of outside of our capacity to do anything with that. We don't censor any data in that way. I'd say that most of the data is outside of areas where there's people anyway, and I, I think that most people follow the rules. You don't fly above people, so I don't really see major challenges of people being in images or people being identif identifiable from directly above either. Mm. Um, now the the second part was that was about usability. Usability, yeah. Um, what, <laughs> give me the same give me the question again. Well, obviously this is part. <laughs> citizen science data. There's a lot of different ways someone can capture an image from a drone. Is it's all of it actually yeah. usable, or how do you filter out what might be valuable, whether it's for mapping the GDR or solving some other environmental challenge? Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, good one. And it's it's interesting. So over the past couple of years, I've had people question, oh, are you going to set some, uh, some capture requirements? So it always needs to be captured at this altitude or from this platform or whatever, anything like that. And what we decided from the outset is actually, no, we don't want any, any restrictions on who can capture, where they capture, why they capture, how they capture any of that at all. Because... People capture for different reasons anyway. When I'm over the reef, I'm usually capturing at 20 metres altitude. If I'm capturing above mangroves, I'm usually about 100 to 120 altitude. And those things are both useful for me at those points in time. And so if I was restricted to a platform that said I could only do one of those, then I cut out all the different options for how that data might be processed down the track as well. The other part of it is that one particular platform capturing at 20 meters altitude will have a different resolution to the next that's captured at 20 meters. And that will vary year on year as we get better platforms as well. So we made the, made the distinction that there is no distinction. You capture as you like, but the metadata is captured. So if you as a user, so John, if you wanted to come and said, you know what, I'm only interested in data of this particular resolution from this platform, whatever, then you can search and filter and cut out and choose for yourself what you want. And the way I I'm, I'm think that we're not quite there yet, but I'm fairly certain that with the techniques that we're building with artificial intelligence and image recognition, that they will be stronger to filter out figuring out is this a feature if it's at one centimeter resolution or if it's a 1.2 centimeters resolution right so i think i have a lot of confidence in where we can take the computer algorithms to deal with the fact that the data capture is not as robust reliable or repeatable as what we see with satellite data no that makes perfect sense and yeah i think AI is probably going to be our one way of solving this problem with such a variable collection of data. The segment anything model that came out the other month has been a really fascinating methodology of baseline infrastructure, see what it can solve. And would be re really curious to see what comes out of the collection in the next few years with more of those analytical techniques. Yeah, absolutely. Segment Anything was really exciting. I'll, I'll pop a link to a blog in the chat as well if people are interested in reading more about that too. But yeah, there's there's so much in that space and so much room for more as well, which is super exciting. And now that we have all the data in one place, so we're, in, we're in a really great position to be able to say, you know what, instead of just training an algorithm in this little location and going, yeah, maybe it's good, well, actually... I can now search the repository and say, find me all the data that are captured across this type of ecosystem, and I'm going to use all of it to train my algorithm and be better. It's definitely a unique challenge. Good luck, I think, uh, trying to label it all up. <laughs> yeah, having fun doing that at the moment. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> 
slow but very critical process in the AI pipeline. How, yeah. Moving forward, how are you looking to leverage GeoNidea then as a platform for partners and really fund its development into the future? Yeah, so we have, we have a couple of different ways that, that again, we fund GeoNidea, just like we did with GMAP. So I was really fortunate to get our initial funding for GeoNidea through James Cook Uni, who's my, my employer. So we set that up there and then I've had federal government funding for that as well through the Boosting Female Founders Initiative, which was really, really fabulous to help get us started and to employ some more staff there as well. And... SmartSat CRC is another one that we're um, funded through, which is helping us do our labelling, John, and uh, and also working with TURN as well as through SmartSat CRC for, for, for some other projects there as well. We, we received a small amount of investment from an angel investor recently, so that, so that helps plug us a little bit. And then we have users on the platform who are paying for certain tools as well. So you don't pay to upload your data or to have a process, but there are certain aspects that that, that are paid options there as well. I guess just like most, most software that you use, there's free components and there's paid components. We do that as well. So a variety of different ways that we're trying to make sure that we maintain our own sustainability so that we don't end up being a big pool of data that just floats off into the ocean as well. That's good to hear. I think we'd much rather prefer to see a platform lasting to help solve some of these data management challenges. Yeah, Kinda... I think it's, it's really important. And for, and for us, that sustainability is critical and where I actually see it as being different to an academic platform. So we, we do see some of these types of things come out of academia and they'll last for a year or two. And then when the government funding dries up, then they stagnate. And that's, yeah, we don't, we don't want to be there. So we've always had, had it in mind that there, there is a business model that underpins it. And that's how we, that's how we're going to make sure that we continue to be able to provide that service to the community and to build geospatial in Australia. Awesome. To try and wrap together a few of the elements we've been speaking about, I've got two final ones for you before we throw it out to the audience. So for those online, please start putting your questions in, in, into the chat. First of these, uh, what new or emerging solutions are you most excited about right now? So I think there's two. I mentioned one to you earlier, John. So I, I, I am definitely excited about having having various drone platforms that are being used for deliveries and, and other types of uses as well, having sensors attached to them that can be capturing our geospatial data for us. And not that I I don't love the idea of drones being everywhere. That's that's not a fun idea to me, but if they are being used for the, for delivery purposes and even if we're looking at uh, taxis and that sort of thing, how, how can we attach sensors to them that are going to be useful for us in the geospatial sense? And the other part that is literally explode, exploding is the artificial intelligence side of things. And it has always been a part of what we do in spatial, but there's really some very cool image recognition bits and pieces that are coming out now and I think in the in the next couple of years we'll see some really amazing leaps and bounds forward as well so really really looking forward to looking at how we implement that and how we have plugins to Jira and Adia so other people can implement their own things to to really harness those capabilities as well beyond just the chat GPT and ads here and there how, how do we actually really make it useful for us so is that an api announcement for geo nadir <laughs> <Come on. laughs> all good all good <laughs> and the last one if you were to start it all over again you're back in the uh, kodak shop what lessons or learnings would you like to tell yourself about the, the career ahead and maybe what to do differently or what someone today should be doing differently? I would probably say I don't have a full-time job and two companies on the side. Fair enough. 
<laughs> but aside from that you know I've, I've been really really fortunate with the work that I do I love what I do I love the amount of time that I get to go out into the field to amazing places like this the opportunities that I get I honestly I can't think of another career that would have provided me such an such an amazing variety of places to go people to meet things to do and things that challenge me as well so I absolutely had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do when I grew up and to be honest I still don't you know I, I keep following things that I enjoy doing and it'll be different again in five years time so I'm not sure that I could have told myself anything different to be honest Fair enough. We look forward to seeing where the journey goes to next. And with that, we might throw over now to those online if you have any questions you'd like to ask Karen and hopefully find out some more. I think we do have one there already from Daphne about how is your data gathering going to determine how much coral is alive on the GBR? Yeah, love the question. Thank you, Daphne. And super important as well. So that's a little bit of maths first. So Great Barrier Reef is 3,000 individual reefs and it covers an, an area about the size of Victoria plus Tassie put together across 2,500 kilometres. When I fly my drone at 20 metres altitude, I would usually cover the area of about 100 by 100 metres. So there is no way that I'm going to fly my drone over the entire Great Barrier Reef to see all the coral like I showed in the picture. I'm yeah, not delusional enough to think that we could we could do the entire Great Barrier Reef at that resolution at this point in time and then have the computing power to analyze it. So that's definitely not what's in the mix. However, what is in the mix is that we have satellite data that easily covers the expanse of the Great Barrier Reef and we have global satellite models that map where the reef is. The challenge is that they don't necessarily do the best job. And if you do want to explore the presentation later there as well, there is a there's a section there having a look at the difference between the Allen Coral Atlas and drone data as well and where we see differences. But so what we coming back to the drone data, what we do have is not just me capturing data, but we have a range of different people and organizations capturing data all up and down the GBR. Definitely not across all 3000 reefs, but what we can do with the data sets that we do have is put them together to help them better train our satellite models to get better results from the satellite data. And with that calibration and validation, that's how hopefully we'll get a lot closer to understanding what we actually have and where. And that, that doesn't have to be on the reef either, right? So that same technique we can use in any ecosystem, whether we're looking at the percentage of live, live vegetation or we're looking at the amount of burned area scars, that sort of thing as well. For those Calval activities, are there any sites, and obviously I think Heron's one of, the, one of the most quintessential where you've got that really deep stack now and are there any trends that have come from even that calibration uh, collection data set? Um, I do have a really amazing, let, let me see if I can find um, something when we talk about calibration and some of the challenges with this. I will find this most amazing animation um, that I can share with you that will also help explain why, why calibration is particularly difficult. So let me let me pull this one up and um, share my screen. So what we can see here. Yeah is a K just off the coast of Townsville on the GBR. And this drone imagery was captured one month apart from each other. So <laughs> that K moved in one month 
it moved about 40 metres north. So the, the one where the K is south is in April this year and then May this year. And so you can actually see it's just started to smother the reef north of it. And so when we think about calibrating and validating satellite data that we might capture over that area maybe once every three years if we're lucky, it's really, really challenging in such a dynamic ecosystem. This also, if we're thinking Landsat, it would you know, be one pixel, so we probably wouldn't see it in the first place. But it also shows how amazing the drone data is to get that. And you think, surely that's wrong, right? But if you have a look at the, the coral in the background, you see there is a slight adjustment between the two, but we had, <laughs> We thought this was one of our ground control points just here. Oh, no. And, yeah, go on. So it made us really rethink what ground control points look like and where they might be as well. That's probably actually a really good point of when you're processing all these different data sets, how do you get it spatially accurate? Yeah, tough question. So the drones have GPS on them or GNSS and every photo is, is tagged with a location. Software then gets it roughly where it should be through the, through the processing. And that's without any additional ground control, that's the best that we get. And it's usually say plus or minus five meters. If, if you have additional ground control or if you have an RTK drone, the real-time kinematic that's, that's getting additional corrections, then we have a higher level of spatial accuracy. And other, otherwise it's a case of then going back and georeferencing post-processing. But what do you georeference to and how do you know which is correct? Because in that case that I just showed you, if you don't want to be georeferencing on the K itself and any of the smaller features aren't visible in satellite data. Yeah. Just, just small problem that one. Just a little bit, yeah. Uh, I know we've had plenty of fun trying to spatially locate islands where there's no control points and no permanent survey marks. So can't imagine it on a little fan cable like that that could yeah. disappear and reappear at will. Yeah, and we're trying to look at its its height variation as cool. well. That's that, that particular project is really looking not just at the X Y movement, but it's is it as well. Yeah, so super challenging. And take the RTK out and your points aren't there anymore. Or even plan your drone survey and the island isn't where you thought it was. I think I've seen that at least once <laughs> in the survey plan. Uh, we have a question here from Giselle. Uh, in your time delivering school incursions with SheMaps, how have the students surprised you with their interest and attitudes towards geospatial technology or their takeaways from the, the program? So we've, over the years, I've worked with kids as young as five or six, so in prep, all the way up to my postgraduate students doing the same sort of training. And I think one thing I'm, one thing I'm surprised at is when I go, when I go to a school who, where they believe that they have a strong base in coding, we'll have teachers say, yeah, no, it's, it's fine. The kids will be awesome at this. Yep, they're all over coding. And what I find is that, yes, they might technically know some of the words of a language of coding, but what they have never been taught is to take an idea and realise how to solve it using coding. So the exact example that I have used personally over 100 times and as a program I think we're up to around about the 500 mark is you're the first on the scene of an area where there's flooding you have a drone you're a geospatial scientist you need to capture the area to get information back to the authorities how do you program your drone to do this and there's a mismatch with how students are taught to code and how they're taught to solve problems. And the ones that have been, the more they've been taught to code, the less they have the 
ability to think of creative solutions to use that code in the first place. So that's that's my first surprise, and that's actually more of a surprise at the education system as, as opposed to the teachers themselves. Um, in terms of interests and attitudes, the most creative solutions come from the youngest of the kids. And that's always fun because the older the the older the student, the more boring their solution is. <laughs> um, so an example is typically the, the older the students, they will fly backwards and forwards like I actually would, like a lawnmower in the sky to capture their data. The best solution I've seen so far is these drones flip. And so the best solution I've seen so far is flip, flip, flip forward, flip to the side, flip, flip, flip back. Um, and others doing spirals, but they only ever come from the youngest kids, um, not not the older ones, and certainly not from the teachers. That could make a really good 3D model, though, with all the oblique photography. Yeah, yeah. and I have 3D modelled it as well. So early in our early days, we did it with Lego, and, yeah, I pushed it through Pix4 data <laughs> from the little drones. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. And then the second question we've got here is what kind of support do you think is the missing link between girls being interested in geospatial questions and technology in childhood and then pursuing careers in spatial technology and science? Or is it just a matter of time? I think that there's a number of factors at play here. So first of all, there's there's no shortage of women taking environmental science at university. So when the GIS and the remote sensing classes sit in an environmental science degree, we typically find, and this is not just the universities that I've taught at, but this is, a, this is looking at statistics across Australia, we typically find that the numbers in that class are gender balanced or sometimes more often there's more women in those classes than men. So what we actually know is that plenty of women are learning remote sensing and GIS at uni, but they're actually not going into geospatial careers. So there's there's a barrier there. I'm not 100% certain what that barrier is. I do know that there are far more geography teachers who are women than men. So I do think that that's an outlet for some women who do those um, who do those subjects at uni. There's a whole host of other work that's going on at the moment, just looking at, at what goes on in a workplace and what barriers are and inclusivity in that. And I think that there's there's a lot of challenges in that space, and we're dealing with it a lot at JCU as well. And I, I definitely don't have the answer. The if you look earlier in the pipeline, we know that kids start making decisions or getting ideas about what they want to do when they grow up and developing these stereotypes from age five or six. And we know that actually some of those stereotypes are even started to be built before the kids are even born. So gender reveal parties, that kind of stuff does all sorts of things so as as students are then passing through the school system there's structural issues in terms of geography being placed at the, at the same time on a timetable with stem subjects there's perceptions around what geography is and what it isn't there's funding issues with more funding being pushed towards stem and geography not being considered stem so Honestly, I don't. There's, there's not one thing that I can think of that you could say if you could just fix that thing, then everything else would flow. I think there's, there's so many things that are integrated here that really build the challenge where we're at at the moment. But the nice thing is that that means that there's lots of things that we can start to pick off. So sorry, it's not really an answer, Giselle. No, but I think that's a really good summary of all the different challenges we're facing on so many fronts to attract a diverse workforce to help us solve some of the really big challenges that geospatial technology is helping to provide a solution or at least a bit more of the picture to 
get fixed. Cool. Do we have any other questions at all from those on the line? Anything else you'd like to ask, whether that's in, in the chat or even just turn your, your mic on and ask away? Very quiet in the chat tonight. Very. Well, we might leave it there then. Karen, thank you so much. It's been a fantastic conversation. We've covered a lot of ground. Uh, the links, of course, to your link tree are in the chat, as is the presentation. Um, is there anywhere else that people can get in contact with you or uh, ways in which we can get involved with the various projects? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, I'll just pop the links in the chat again there in case anyone didn't get them earlier. Feel free to reach out. I'm also pretty Googleable. So if you just Google Karen Joyce, you'll you'll find me or something on socials. So please feel free to get in touch, say hi, and jump on any of the, the resources that I've also added in the presentation. Great. Right, thanks so much. I'll throw back to Giselle to wrap up. Thanks, John. Thanks, John, and thank you so much, Karen, for your um, very detailed presentation and also your very, very thorough answers to those questions, um, particularly the, the last one. I agree there's not, I don't think there's one barrier in the way, um, but I suppose, like you said, the kind of positive thing about that is that any any changes that we can make or any ways that we can sort of challenge the status quo should hopefully have a positive impact in the future. Um, as we finish up tonight, I would like to thank everyone for coming and participating, um, as well as our presenter, of course, and um, John as our interviewer. Um, I'd also like to draw your attention to some of the events that IGSQ has coming up later in this month. Um, we have an event coming up on the 27th of June uh, in the evening that is called Native Bees, Biodiverse Environments and Innovations in Horticulture. Should be quite an interesting one. Um, and of course, we have our monthly lecture series. Our next one will be Tuesday, the 4th of July, starting at 7.30 as usual in person at RGSQ in Spring Hill and also on Zoom as well. And that will be about pandemics, warnings from the past and lessons for the future. Uh, we also at the moment have running our Soils for Science collection. Um, there's been a bit of a mail out about that to our RGSQ members. If you're interested in potentially collecting some soil from your backyard, um, we're running a partnership at the moment with, with IMB from UQ um, and those soil samples will be going towards that institute to do some research on um, potentially finding some cures to future superbugs. So if that's something that you might be interested in, send an email through to RGSQ, info at rgsq.org.au um, with your details and we'll get a kit sent out to you or you might be able to come into Spring Hill and get a kit. Um, with that, I think we're good to wrap up for the night. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for coming. And hopefully we'll see you in the future at some more RGSQ events and potentially some more Geography Matters events. Thank you all and have a good night.